We've been dealing with several passages out of the book of Joshua, and I really want to start where we left off and then work our way back to something I think that's significant. Remember, we talked about Caleb, this 85-year-old warrior in Israel, and he and Joshua, the only two left of that age, coming back to Joshua and reminding him of what Moses had told them when those two were spies in that promised land, and they were the only ones that came back with a, a statement that said, we can take this land. It's great. The people are strong. But with God being with us, we can take this land. And now, on, as they're ready to go into that land, Caleb reminds Joshua of that and says, well, there's an area that I want you to give me, and it's not an area that's very easy. It's going to be difficult to conquer, but I really want to do this. I want to fight. In the process of that, in, in Joshua chapter 14 and verse 13, Joshua blessed, blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. There's a lot of significance to that particular area, not just the city, and because the way that the term is used, it's also used in connection with the surrounding area of the city of Hebron. But for the ones who are going into that land, for individuals that have grown up hearing the stories of their patriarchs, this has a t tremendous significance. So I want to call your attention to several passages in Genesis. We're going to finally work our way up to something stated in 2 Samuel. And then see if we can draw some applications, maybe at what Caleb might have been feeling in, through all of this. So if you would, turn with me back to the book of Genesis, back to uh, chapter 13. In the beginning of, in verse 14, there's a statement that God makes to Abram because there's been some uh, clashes between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. Uh, they've been very prosperous. The, the livestock that they possess has been growing. You know, none of pasture in the same area for them. And remember the story that Abram tells Lot, his nephew, take a look and pick out the choice areas where you want to, to actually dwell. And he looks towards the valley where you find Sodom and Gomorrah. Beginning in verse 14, after Lot separates from Abram, God says to Abram, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Verse 18 Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees at Memory, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Hebron, dwelling place of the patriarch of the nation of Israel. Go about ten chapters past this, over to, uh, to chapter 23, and it shows up again. Beginning in verse 1, Sarah lived 127 years. These are the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. In the conversations between Abraham and individuals that are living in that area, verses 3 down through verse 17 or so, you find he purchases a particular place in which to to bury Sarah as, a, as her final resting place. Verse 19, He buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the, of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron, the land of Canaan. Now let's go from this chapter, just a couple chapters later, to chapter 25, beginning in verse 7. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years, then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before memory in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, where Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. The final place for Sarah and Abraham. But we're not finished. Go from chapter 25 to chapter 35, verse 27 through 29. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. 
and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. And you start thinking about Moses being the author of these first five books and recording the history of the patriarchs as he's inspired by God to do so. And you think about the children of Israel being familiar with these stories. What kind of thoughts might go through the mind of Caleb when he actually is given this city and its surrounding area as an inheritance? He thinks about all the things that have transpired in Hebron. But we're not yet finished. Let's go to chapter 37 of Genesis, right about in the middle of the chapter. Jacob says to Joseph in verse 14, because all of the brothers of Joseph have gone to take care of their, their livestock in the area of Shechem. So here are the instructions to Joseph. Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. You could argue that the very beginning of the story of, of Joseph being sold into slavery and everything that transpires for the next few decades until he's reunited with his family begins here in the city of Hebron. Hebron is mentioned specifically in, in Numbers chapter 13 when the spies actually go out and spy out the land. It's, it's a place upon which they, they have uh, trod. It's a place where they've walked. They've actually viewed the fortifications as they do in so many other areas. 2 Samuel chapter 2. The setting has a, another significant factor. The statements made in verse 11 of 2 Samuel chapter 2 that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah. By the time you get to chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, verse 3, all the elders of Israel came to the king, to, to David, at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Verse 5, in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Now, granted, this last item about Hebron happens long after Caleb is gone. But think about the legacy just of this area. Well, what's the significance of all of these little items? Especially think back to the context of, of Caleb now settling in this area. Um, it's later something that is given to the Levites. An inheritance that he actually bestows upon others as we've talked about before. What do you keep in your heart if you're given something that you classify as a legacy for your people? Would it ever be the case that Caleb would think about the history of this city and think, well, you know, maybe I can become as, as great as Abraham? No. Uh, well, how about, how about Isaac or, or Jacob or even Joseph? And the answer is going to be no, because you find Caleb having that humble heart, a heart that wholly, totally, completely follows God and wants to do God's will. There are situations in life where we can think back to individuals that influenced us tremendously uh, to become a Christian or to focus our life as a Christian, to be involved in, in living as best we can uh, in the way that we know that God expects. And because of the influence of those individuals, we, we really maybe in some instances classify ourselves as being a part of that legacy that we can really never match up to. I can think of individuals that I've, I've listened to in years past, sat at their feet, as it were, and were amazed at the amount of knowledge they had of God's Word, with the realization that I don't think I'll ever be able to memorize Scripture as, as they have, uh, or have that insight that they possess, or maybe a way to communicate in, in such a way that it, it makes God's Word come alive. Well, the Word of God actually comes alive on its own. We just have to read it and follow it. You've heard me say over and over again over the last few years that the Word of God actually outlines itself. It really does. And sometimes it's easy perhaps to, to pick passages here and there and, and kind of like we did this morning, but there's a theme that runs through them. And if I can keep that theme in mind and, and 
endeavor never to do an injustice to the text itself, then even to us as we talk about it or speak it or teach it or whatever, the, the message of God's Word becomes alive once more. What things in your life, spiritually speaking, are things that really create a legacy that you want to follow? Um, I wonder how, how many times Caleb, over the next few years of his life, would think about the significance of what he received as an inheritance. Would he think about the greatness of that area and because of that determined that I want to continue to totally follow God? The phrase, he wholly followed the Lord, is something that's stated of him several places. Uh, that is something that he wants to continue. But the same is true with us. Individuals that have influenced us, we want to take what we have learned and what we've studied and apply it in ways that do not um, mar the legacy of the spirituality in their life. We want to grow to be more spiritual in ours. The city of Hebron we mentioned earlier, I think we mentioned the, the last time we were together, uh, is a word that means uh, an association, and some have suggested it really kind of carries with the idea of fellowship. I wonder how often Caleb's thinking about fellowship with those who've gone before when he thinks about the inheritance he's received. May we never forget those that have gone before that have influenced us in great ways. May we always keep their legacy alive. And because of that, our fellowship with Christ and with those of like precious faith grow stronger with each passing day. Stay safe. We'll talk again soon.